Well, Wendy and Ricky, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having us, Arlena. Thanks so much. Of course. I'm super excited to talk to you and Ricky about Ricky's book, Dream Out Loud, A Sneakerhead's Path to Redemption. <laughs> and as we talk, I'm looking at your background with all kinds of sneakers in the background. Where are you sitting at the moment? Uh, we are sitting at Havasol headquarters in Los Angeles. Um, and yes, I am still very much in love with tennis shoes. <laughs> As you should be. <laughs> Who doesn't love a good sneaker? Um, and tell me a little bit about what Havasol is. Well, Havasol on paper would be a nonprofit organization that was founded by me in 2014. Uh, we collect and distribute quality footwear to underserved communities um, here in Los Angeles and in other major cities across the United States. Um, and to date, we've given out over uh, 50,000 pairs of sneakers, and that values over $4 million of footwear to those in need. Um, that's the, the long uh, story short. That's awesome. That's amazing. It's, it's amazing work that you do. And, and I mean, um, you're just a chip off the old block as we were just saying <laughs> earlier. <laughs> Wendy is a giver and a woman of service. That's why when she was like, Hey, can we come on your podcast? And I was like, listen, anything you need, I'm your girl. So, uh, super excited to talk about this. I've heard Wendy. So Wendy, you and I have had a couple of chats before we've talked about mother load and oh my gosh, my brain just blanked. Incorrigible. Incorrigible. Oh man. Yeah. So mm -hmm. good. Well Thank done, you. Wendy. I, Thank so, you. Such good work. Um, and so now I'm really so excited to hear Ricky's side of it <clears throat> because uh, Ricky lived through it. And so this story, it sounds like it takes off where um, do you actually, do you want to tell that story? Who wants to tell that story? Well, hmm. I'll start and then I'll pass it to Ricky. Got so, it. Um, uh, mother load starts with me and a psychotic break, and I end up shooting my husband's mistress in the arm and going to jail. Okay, that's where mother load starts, and it tells my whole journey of going through the jail system and getting out and getting sober. But <clears throat> it focuses on my experience. This book is from his point of view, and you can take it from there. Yeah, I was actually asleep on the couch when the gunshots rang out. Um, I slept through them. And my first memory was being woken up by the LA County sheriffs and just kind of a, a mess. Um, didn't see any parents, didn't see anybody but you know law enforcement. And you know they took me to the sheriff's station where I was still confused and didn't know what was going on. And, and one of my clear memories of that night was my mom walking uh, through the doorway in handcuffs. And um, that's when I knew something had really went wrong. And that's where Dream Out Loud kind of starts. And it, 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 like she said, it goes through my journey um, and, you know, what I had to, you know, go through as a nine-year-old. Um, her doing a year in prison, you know, when she gets out, I'm 10 years old, and then, you know, moving into a new school system, um, having a lot of anger issues. Transitional living. Yeah, and, and, and moving into a women and children's transitional living center, um, you know, knowing that we're poor now, and, you know, that, that uh, transitional living was in Santa Monica, so most of my classmates weren't poor. They weren't on welfare. They had everything. So, you know, I was, uh, I picked up on that pretty quickly that we were poor. Um, so yeah, then it just goes from not being able to get what I want as far as footwear and, and you know, clothing and, and trying to fit the image that my classmates have, you know, trying to fit in more. So, you know, I remember uh, not having the right footwear for basketball and just, you know, being on a basketball court, working on my, my, my left-handed layups and, and just having big holes in my sneakers and saying, mom, you know, I need, I need shoes. And she's just like, no, I can't, I really can't afford them. Um, you know, and I just thought she was saying that, but I, it just made me, you know, more angry. And from there, 
let's see what happened. So we were at the transitional living and a woman named Becky was visiting and sharing her story with the women and children or mostly the women and, you know, the kids were just kind of off doing their thing. Um, but after that meeting, um, she was talking to Becky and I, I just, I had enough. I, I ran up to them. I said, Hey, these holes, they've gotten so much bigger. Um, you know, as a 10 year old, just not holding anything back, embarrassed her. And, um, it was more like mom, these shoes. And he's like, he's got one in his hand and he's going, they've got the holes are big. I mean, so he was a very uh, dramatic 10 year old, an angry, dramatic 10 year old. Okay. okay. So I was angry and dramatic. <laughs> Gee, I wonder where she got it. I wonder where he got it from. With it. <laughs> a chip off the old block, as they say. Apple and tree. Yeah. Yep. Yep. In the lap. Yeah. So, <laughs> but that did it. I mean, that was enough. And Becky didn't hesitate. She was like, I can buy him shoes. And mom was like, mm -hmm. no, that's okay. And I'm like, but mom, please. And then we ended up going to the band store that same day. And, and Becky bought me two pairs of bands. So I remember just the confidence that came along with a pair of shoes. Mm. And I remember the feeling that I had. And I remember the smell of the shoes. And I just said, okay, you know, I love shoes. I, I know whatever I do in life, I, I want new shoes. That, that started my addiction for uh, footwear. And <laughs> Wendy's pointing in the background yes. <laughs> to all the <laughs> shoes. Yeah. Yeah. These are just some display shoes. This is not my collection or anything. But Oh no, we won't count this as your. Yeah, we won't. We won't. We'll save that for another episode. Um, <laughs> Maybe send me pictures so I can post them on that. Yeah, uh, and yeah, that just was a, a moment that really meant a lot to me. Was this this woman that I didn't know, um, mm. who bought me a pair of shoes, got me two, and I remember that. Yeah, there's something so profound about having this desperate need. And then getting that need fulfilled. And then the contrast between, you know, having that pain and then having that pain alleviated, like contrast is so intense, man. I used to talk about that with, you know, with alcohol, but it really can be anything. And then you get that dopamine hit and you're like, this is the mm -hmm. shit. I, this is the feeling I am going to chase. This is the thing that's going to make me okay. And it becomes this external quest it becomes a quest of, you know, chasing. And, and so, um, I don't mean to put words in your mouth, but man, I relate to that. I relate to that on a really deep level. So, um, so mom gets out, Wendy gets out. Mm -hmm. She is Wendy remind me, um, did you immediately get sober after that? So you're going to 12 step or what's the timeline? Well, I was, it was mandatory that I go to 12 step meetings at the time. And I used to drag him along and he would hate it. So, <laughs> you know, the, the um, kind of uh, the relationship was very challenging, newly sober. You know, the wreckage of my past was evident between uh, Ricky and my older son was in juvenile hall at first and later he went to prison. But it, there was a lot of wreckage that had to be healed, but I didn't have the tools initially to navigate, like, how do I communicate? You know, and and going to meetings was so painful for him. He was so defiant and non-compliant, and you know, um, he just he just hated going to meetings. But Ricky, why why did why did you hate going to meetings so much? Was it just boring? Cigarette smoke, um, a bunch of the same stories. Uh, I couldn't relate. Um, yeah, just like I didn't understand the sense of humor when people were speaking. And I was just like, you know, I didn't do this to us. Why do I have to come here? You know, that's, oh, yeah. that's it. What's the, what's the point, you know? And he'd rather play Nintendo at home or Atari, whatever, yeah. you yeah. know? Listen, I wouldn't be going to meetings if I didn't have to be there. <laughs> I get it. So, okay. So, and you, so you have a lot of anger. They say that anger is a sign of an unmet need. And I would imagine, um, you know, you had a lot of unresolved feelings. When were you able to start resolve it? Like, what was the anger? What did, what was the anger about for you? And when did you start finding a way to resolve it? Hmm. Well, as soon as we moved into transitional living, I was angry. Um, that was when I was in elementary school and then I played sports in middle school. Um, 
um, got to high school, started playing basketball. Um, I was smoking weed uh, in ninth grade, but then in in the 10th grade, I, I refocused and I said, you know what, I want to play basketball for my school. So, you know, I knew that I had to get my grades up and I had to stop smoking. So um, that's what I set my goal on. So that kind of redirected my anger a little bit. So I played for two years from my high school, but I was still getting in trouble. You know, there's still a lot of like, you know, stealing and just, you know, getting into the streets. Um, and I got kicked out of my high school and had to go to uh, another one. And, you know, that was frustrating. I was like, man, I'm, I got to leave all my friends. Um, so, you know, that was really, you know, basketball saved my anger for a bit. And then, you know, I fell back into some, some sadness and depression, and just anger. Um, and then I get into, I didn't graduate from high school and I ended up just going straight to work. Um, and, you know, that was, um, good for me but I was I was just doing like construction and Toys R Us and I had like these odd jobs that really weren't um anything that I loved but what I could do with my jobs where I could buy a pair of shoes of my own so I made sure that like you know from every check I'd buy at least one pair so I was getting a few pairs a month and and that was uh that was something I always loved to do yeah, yeah. Wendy, how are you helping him cope with his anger during this? Because that's a, that's kind of a long period, you know, from, you know, when you got out when he was about 10 years old to, you know, through that high school period, what well, was your tried, relationship like? We tried therapy, um, you know, and because I was on like welfare or, and then I inevitably got a job uh, and was eligible for um, uh, therapy at a sliding scale rate, but he wasn't really receptive at the time to talking. The therapist said he doesn't really talk about anything. Um, and um, so, you know, I, you know, I just knew that I had to stay sober. And it was like, you know, I may have said this to you before. It was like, at first, I just wanted to say, you know, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for everything that happened. And I did that, you know, but it was more about, making living amends. And by be, making living amends, going to those meetings, he, he met somebody that mm. would end up be his, being his mentor. That would be, he was like, even though, you know, he's not, I, not going to, it doesn't need to go to meetings. He's under the influence of Alcoholics Anonymous. Right, he, yeah. He was influenced by um, my friends who were very service orientated. They were like giving back, they were, um, you know, so this mentor showed up in his life. Why didn't talk about that? Yeah, perfect timing. Um, I remember the, the, uh, the venue of the meeting. I remember everything about it downstairs. Um, what St. Augustine's? On Fourth and Wilshire. Fourth and Wilshire, and you know, it smelled of cigarettes, and I that's I hated it the most. So, I just remember seeing a dog. You know, I love animals, and and you know, I was attracted to the the, the dog and said hi and we met this guy named Gary and um yeah it was just a, a time in his life where he wanted to be more of service and, and and have a role in 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 my life and it was just like perfect timing so you know after she asked around about him and he was um you know reliable and consistent uh he started taking me out rollerblading and I would say I really have to look at a calendar, but he was he was showing up every Sunday for over ten years and didn't and like Gosh. missed one. You know what I mean? So I could like the consistency that he provided me with, I trusted him. Uh, and then you know, after rollerblading, he took me like sailing and and go kart racing and would bring some of my friends and and we would just have all these like adventures with and, sober people. Yeah. 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 So, um, yeah, Gary was just like right on time. Um, that's another thing outside of basketball that really redirected me, um, somewhat, you know, I was always on the fence. It was always like, okay, I, I'm, I'm acting crazy and I'm getting in trouble here. And I got these positive role models, um, you know, Gary and basketball, but it was just hard to really figure out what side I wanted to be on. So Gary, mm -hmm. I just want to, say that Gary 
had um, a difficult youth himself and got it in the court system and in foster homes. Mm -hmm. And he, somebody mentored him and it changed his life. So he was looking for a way to be of service for someone to mentor. And there Ricky is, and the, the dude is like, he's so cool, you mm -hmm. know? Gary's so cool and so, he's so much like a kid, you know? And <laughs> I vetted him with my friends and, you know, he just, he important. was important. And, um, you know, he was a solid guy, you know, yeah. in, the, in the community. And, um, you know, over the years, he just was there. He was just there. Yeah. Where was, uh, where was your father during this time? Um, back in Lomita, where the, uh, the shooting took place, South Bay, California. And, um, right where, where I some yeah. back in some heat back there. Oh my gosh. Were you wing the bitch? Is that what you said the first time? <laughs> Let's restart this whole thing. Oh, oh my sorry. God. Sorry. Oh, we're not, talk no, we're not talking about that. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. It's, <laughs> her just talking about whoa, whoa, whoa. She's like, you know, that's my mama. So <laughs> embarrassed son right there. <laughs> yeah, I gotta take my days out on this one because it's kind of fun to embarrass the son. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, she she's hilarious. hilarious. So I was just curious about your dad because Gary sounded like a neutral male role adult figure in your life that um that you could trust and have consistency so um but where was your father during this time is he consistent in your life at all no i'm not consistent uh showed up every now and again um that wouldn't be till years later that we'd have more of a relationship but mm -hmm. we're, i mean you know yeah he was just um in the streets in the streets doing his thing and and would visit you know every once in a while. Yeah, that's hard. So I'm curious the, um, you know, from a mom's point of view, you know, we get sober and it's like, we create all this wreckage it's, and then we, we try to find our way back to our children. Right. And this is a story that I've heard many times, right. Mom gets sober and is doing her best to heal and be a productive person, be the mom that you need, but it doesn't really dissolve in an instant, all the things that had happened before that. So did you have, Ricky, did you have a desire to like, have a closer relationship with your mom or during that period, were you just so angry that you, you really couldn't connect? How, what did that look like for you? I don't think I could connect. Uh, back then and you know I, I just wanted everything my way and you know the anger with both of them I didn't know who to trust you know one parent saying one thing the other saying another and I just I'm just a kid you know I'm just a kid and you know I, I, all I know is my my classmates have fresh pairs of Jordans on and I don't so mm -hmm. if my mom's not going to get it then I'm going to go out there by any means necessary and, and you know get what I need for myself. So, um, but the relationship was just, it was hard for a lot of years. It was, it was very difficult. And, you know, the, the one thing I remember that um, I think is worth mentioning, we were living in like a, an apartment that was like a small transitional living mm -hmm. apartment. Next door, there was another mother and her daughter next door and the walls, were paper thin and I could hear the mother yelling at her daughter all the time all the time just yelling calling her daughter names and I said that's I mean I didn't say that to Ricky I said to me that's not going to happen here you know that is not going to happen because what became my priority is healing the family you know I, I very much fell in love with recovery and mm -hmm whatever that takes, you know, and I didn't do it perfectly as parents, we never do it perfectly, you know, but um, when I entered into recovery, things had shifted, even if he didn't, and I think he, you know, on, on some level, kids start to see, you know, that you're showing up, you know, that you're coming to his basketball game, or that, you know, things are difficult, we're going through some difficulty, and you're not drinking or using. So they start, they're paying attention, although 
it's I don't know, you know, if they're integrating it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm still a teenager. You know, I'm still a teenager and want to do what I want to do. And you know, having her as the authority, I'm just like, no, you, you already messed up. You blew it. You know what I mean? So I don't have to listen to you. So it was that constant back and forth battle with her trying to, to get me under control and and she couldn't. Man, I remember, I remember those days, um, I was, you know, being the rebellious teen, um, just having to be forced to be independent. So in a certain way, right. Like I got jobs ever since I was, I've had two or three jobs since I was 13. Right. And just because I needed to get what I needed to get. Right. And what ends up happening is I remember my mom used to say, oh man, I gave you girls so much independence. And then she would try to instill her rules. And I'm like, you can't have it both ways. You don't get to force me to be independent and then expect me to follow your rules. It doesn't, it doesn't really, it doesn't really work like that. Right. Did you, so did you feel like you had been, um, you know, forced to be independent and take on too much of your own responsibility because there wasn't a lot of money in the house to pay for things like shoes and. Yeah, exactly. Well said. And, and that's, I relate to that a lot. Uh, as far as you know how I was growing up so yeah well said for sure yeah so let's fast forward a little bit um you know because when we were just before we hit record we're talking about healing the family system right and I feel like guilt and shame is one of those things that's inevitable when coming out of addiction so what are the things that you two have done to not only heal individually, but heal your relationship to each other? What's it like today? Um, I think that uh, I started becoming very honest, learning how to be honest. And um, because I grew up with secrecy in my house and, you know, Ricky grew up with secrecy. He didn't know his dad and mom were using you know, and um, so it's, I started becoming very honest and I learned that in my recovery, I learned that also in the process of writing and coming out with my story, mm -hmm. um, the shame that I felt um, when I wrote my first book, it felt like it didn't, it didn't own me anymore. Mm -hmm. But uh, the communication between Ricky and I now, it's like, he has his own level of recovery, whether he sees it or not. We can communicate like when I, you know, when he's short with me or he's like, you know, impatient because I work a lot with Havasol, um, I will point out to him and he'll say, I'm sorry. You know, he'll own his, his part and vice versa. You know, I think that is our, the level of honesty and depth that we have in our relationship. And what do you think? What else do you think, Ricky? I mean, for me, you know, I, I started to um, get a better understanding of, of just people and, and, you know, human connection when Have a Soul started. Uh, and that was by me loading up my shoes, not, not really loving material items like I once did and, and wanting something more, searching for some purpose uh, that really opened up my eyes. I, I hit the streets and I started meeting different people. Um, and through my photography, I would share stories uh, on social media and, and just, it was a real outlet for me. So um, yeah, I think right around that time, I decided that I wanted to be honest 100% um, of the time. So I think honesty is a good call out um, and just being, you know, who you are uh, and I think that has helped me, you know, in a sense, like when I'm out there meeting people and I'm, I'm working with them and, and hearing a little bit about their story or their journey, then that's, you know, that's a little bit of my therapy too. So I'm able to then bring that back into our relationship and, and, and just say, you know, here, I was wrong here, uh, or this is where I feel like um, I was right, you know, and being able to um, just communicate well, you know, and a lot better. So that's also helped me in, um, you know, I'm newly married. So helping me in that communication as well. Um, just trying to be honest and, and patient. But yeah. 
I want to just go back and, you know, like what happened when Ricky moved out? Because I think he was in a hurry to get out of the house. Oh, yeah. He moved out right away when he was 18. And, you know, his, the story continued, his story continued. Mm -hmm. However, when he was struggling, he would reach out to me. He would call me and tell me like what he was going through. And so this was just by me being sober and being consistent. I think you know, that I was his kind of sounding board in my wrong mm -hmm. during your struggles at times? Yeah, I knew for, I think with your journey, I, I knew I can find honesty if I, and when I went back and like, hey, I'm struggling here with this relationship or I'm struggling here in this job or this or that. Um, you know, I, I knew at the very least she'd be honest and, and have a, a very solid opinion on on where I should go next. So um, if I couldn't figure it out myself or with, um, you know, my friends, then yeah, I, I knew I had a safe place to say, hey, man, mm -hmm. this job sucks. Like, what can I, you know, what do you think? And then she'd give me a, she'd offer up a, a great opinion. You know, you hit on something that's so important. You, you said she was a safe place. Mm -hmm. And I think it, you know, that's a sign that there was trust. And I feel like, that's a lot of the work of recovery is, you know, developing a safe space so that we can allow the things, uh, like things that maybe, uh, give us a challenge, guilt or shame or whatever. Um, if you have a safe place to go to, it allows you to process those feelings more. Um, congratulations, by the way, on your, on your wedding. That's amazing. Uh, mm -hmm. when was your, when did you get married? Uh, just a few months back, uh, in May. Oh, in May. Yeah, you better get that date nailed down. <laughs> I have, I have a date. This, this, that's my production mind, just trying not to timestamp it uh, so I could, I don't know, just say, yeah. Just <laughs> yeah. I'm just messing with you. Um, I love how you guys have been able to um, you know, do your work together and do your work separately. Like what I was hearing, Ricky, when you were talking about doing the service work to others, um, it sounds, it sounded like, you know, as, and this is the thing I love about service is that, um, I feel like it's a way to help us build our self-esteem, but haven't you found that like, when you show up for somebody, sometimes we say the exact thing that we need to hear. Like, I'm sure you're looking at these little kids and you're talking to the younger you, like you're able to say to them the exact thing you needed to hear when you were young, right? That's, 100%. have you had, you must have had so many amazing experiences with these kids. Oh man. Yeah. You know, we, we deal with, um, you know, foster youth, um, older youth, uh, men, women, elderly, and yeah, it's just, it's really given me the opportunity to connect with so many people here in LA and all around the United States. And, you know, I learn from every moment. And, you know, I think that's why I keep going is because it's always something new. If there's always somebody there that I can connect with, you know, whether it is that kid that reminds me of the younger me. And I, I have yeah. that story of saying, hey, you know, I used to do this or that. I did that and and they're like, oh wow, yeah, I, you know, I know what that's like. Yeah. And then I can offer up some some wisdom uh, that makes sense to them. It's non non judgmental and it's it's mm. you know, right on target. And you know, it's only because I've I've been through similar scenarios. Yeah, um, you know, like we went back to Claire Foundation, the place that we were at. We mm -hmm. were in the their women and children, but with Have a Soul, we have gone back and given shoes out to all the residents that are in for substance abuse and alcoholism. And, you know, I'll never forget one mother, <clears throat> she had heard our story, you know, and she saw us there. I mean, she was witnessing us giving out shoes and she came up to me in tears, you know, saying, thank you so much for doing this because I lost custody of my son. And I feel like I can never restore that relationship so mm -hmm. it was just in the knowing that of our story and our background and the fact that we were there together giving out shoes that is like a message you know a powerful yeah. message 
A hundred percent, just showing up and showing people that, uh, you know, they say that hope is hearing other people's experience and just by showing up, you guys are demonstrating that and giving so much hope to the moms. I don't know if the kids necessarily need to see it maybe in hindsight, but, uh, man, for the moms, for the parents, I shouldn't exclude the dads, but yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's really important for the parents to have hope that they'll be able to reconnect. Yeah. The kids know too. I think you know if, if whether they they recognize it that day or or you know later on, you know because we've had, um, you know from that same we had Claire alumni, um, where she worked at Claire and her son was there watching us and then years later he's he's now like seventeen and he he came to volunteer with us to help me with inventory and it's like, you know she had mentioned that that he. Uh, he really loved what we did when he was like a 12 year old and oh he remembered he remembered so um to have him come back a few times was really cool so really cool i mean it's it's like you're planting seeds you know right yeah just like becky gave him those shoes that was a seed planted it took right. two decades before he would pay it forward but <clears throat> you know, the, the, you know, kids remember, you know, kids remember and what really touches them, you know, even though it doesn't show up for, for years sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Well, that's how it is, you know, in recovery too, you know, sometimes we get, it's not, it's, there's not one single event that helps us to heal. It's like an accumulation of all the things that finally tips us over into more of a healing place. Um, Ricky, when did you start writing when did you start writing the book? Well, after Mother Lowe came out, you know, I was like, wow, that took me way back. And, you know, I, I just thought, because I'm a photographer, I love to creative story tell via, you know, my photography and, and social media. And, you know, we've done our own content. And um, I was like, wow, Mother Lowe, that's powerful. I, you know, I wonder. Oh, what you're, yeah. Yeah. Um, hold on. Okay. Um, <laughs> Guys are so cute. So, Typical mother son. That's that's the dynamic that we have here. You, know, <laughs> so you got to pay attention. It's it that doesn't change. That one that's one thing that doesn't change. Uh, that mother son dynamic. So now uh, I have two boys. I totally get it. Oh, good, 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 good. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, since since she interrupted me, I forgot my train of thought. I will go. To I was asking you about that when you started writing the book, and you were saying that mother load sort of uh, triggered something for you. Yeah, yeah. So mother load had had just you know it had been so powerful and. You know, we all read it, and and to her point that she wants me to bring up is when my father read it, and, and called me and and said, "I wish I would have been a better father," and I was like, "Wow, that's that's huge." Oh my God. I know it was just like, okay, um, let's let's my get. Eyes, on excuse me, my eyes are leaking. <laughs> oh my God, here yeah. he read it too. Yeah, he read, he read it. it. So he loved it. Really. Yeah. I mean, it's a good book, but I didn't know if he would really appreciate, it. <laughs> you know, all things considered. Okay. But, uh, so he, he said he wished he would have been a better father. Yeah. Yeah. So that was an incredible thing to just hear. And, and, um, you know, so shout out to him and, you know, while I'm talking about just healing in general, you know, then we, we have to include my, my bigger brother who, um, you know, through all his adversity had been, you know, he's a, is an amazing father and we talk about consistency like he is the most consistent uh father that i've seen i'm like dude like that is incredible you know he's 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 um he's hard on them in a in a great way that keeps them so motivated and and i, I love to see um that you know as his brother and just you know and and watching how his kids are now i'm like athletes just athletes and then his two girls are just brilliant like like wow this is incredible so the book i think really inspired some of that and you know just along with our own journey where we were but you know i was like man it would, it would be cool to see like what my point of view is from this um you know and i you know i played around with the thought and you know we had one author reach out and, and did a quick interview and, and, you know, she's kind of like my consultant. So she was like, well, that, that could be cool. Yeah, let's do that. Okay. But then he just, he just fell off the, the earth and she was like, she didn't hesitate. She was like, let me write it. And I was like, well, 
that's right it together. Yeah, you know, and 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 that's where it started. That was the idea. She was like, I would like to write the story. But then for me, I was like, okay, cool, like let's do it. And that's when we started to collaborate on on certain stories. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, and and yeah, it just it just took off from there. And and reliving some of the stories were that was a challenge, you know, hearing, you know, looking at oh, the, sure. looking at the page and say, wow, I really did that as a as a kid. That that's pretty crazy um so that's you know that's how dream out loud started you know it it was just uh you know inspired by mother load and and uh yeah why did you why did you feel like you mentioned uh, it's a sneakers path to redemption what were you being redeemed from uh i mean you just have to read the book. That's what they say, right? <laughs> I got yeah, that all the her. all the good stories are in the book, but we're just taught. I've got that from her. I've seen her say that, and I feel like that's the right time. But no, there's just you know just a lot of things that I went through, you know, and, and yeah. behaviors, behaviors, and I caused a lot of people pain, and and right. was, um, I understand that now. So um, yeah, it was just a, a way to you know make up for what I did a long time ago. Do you feel that writing the book has, has been, um, helpful to you in the fact that you can kind of look back on your younger self with compassion for the pain you were carrying and the, and the acting out that you did? That's a good question. That's a good question. I think back, do I have compassion for my younger self? Uh, I never really thought about it that way. And it's, it's really good to think about because you know, I just say it was, it all happened for a reason, you know, it, it all happened, you know, my mom went through what she went through. She had her childhood and, and like all of these crazy just moments in our life got us to where we are now. And mm-hmm. we feel super fortunate that that is the case. Um, but I, I do think that I should look back and say, wow, um, that was crazy, but try to forgive yourself, you know, so I really appreciate you saying that. Yeah. I mean, the thing that comes up for me is about, I mean, I'm I'm kind of obsessed with um, compassion Mm -hmm. because they say, they say that empathy is the antidote to shame. Right. And I see these people, um, kids too, you know, they have trauma in their life and because of that trauma, they behave a certain way right? Uh, A lot of the behaviors that we have are coping strategies, but they're typically not healthy ones. Disassociation is a coping strategy. Anger is a coping strategy. Um, There's many, you know, adrenaline, distraction, all these things are, but it's a distraction from pain, right? Mm -hmm. And and so um, it seems like we are so hard on ourselves, meaning like uh, we don't give ourselves compassion. It's like a little kid doesn't have, shouldn't have the responsibility of trying to, you know, meet their own needs financially and things like that. So I think it's so important to, with the understanding that we have now kind of reframe what it was, you know, like we could have, how we could have been different, you know, without the, like you were carrying trauma. And so yeah. some of those behaviors came from that. That's, and that's what we're doing today, right? Like we're all on this healing journey. And so the the family is healing and you guys are an amazing example of what can um, flourish in the mother son relationship. You, you guys are working together. Yeah. I mean, I, I do several jobs, but um, <laughs> I'm working, um, adolescent mental health, but um, yeah. I, you know, I'm of service to have a soul i do it for fun and for free yeah. and um you know it's it's to me it's changing the trajectory of the family system and it's yeah. like you know uh, i my lineage is riddled with alcoholism addiction suicide um mental illness and to see him out there um do, being of service as a direct result of what was taught to me in recovery it's mm-hmm. like you know, this, it's like truly passing it on, you know, yeah. passing on this legacy, because it, it was the principle of service that was embedded in me and to, and Gary Drake, mm-hmm. you know, his mentor and the people that he was, you know, surrounded by so many kind people, mm-hmm. you know, and when you're a badass, you know, it's like, we don't have a defense against kindness. Kindness can really, really 
get in there and just yeah. crack this open. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have you ever been on the verge of tears and someone goes, Oh, are you okay? With a little bit of kindness, <laughs> you fall apart instantly. Yeah. That is that. I mean, love, that is the most powerful force on the planet. Yeah. yeah you guys are doing really good work. Um, what would you like? What would you like me to ask you? Is there anything that you think is really important? What's the message that you really would like to take it out there about either your book or the foundation? question is that too big a question <laughs> i can kind of knock it down a little i mean there's just there's a lot happening you know we just opened up new chapters in portland and dallas and we're looking how that's amazing thank you looking out how we can open up in, you know a few other cities to just have national reach um you know the book of course is is very exciting so to have opportunities like this is is uh you know early on in in, in dreaming out loud so um, if I can just dream out loud and, and share that was, you know, she and I being able to sit down with people to, to, to share our stories, to hopefully inspire them so we can just uh, do that. So once the, the, books, uh, the book comes out, my memoir, you know, we'll be able to, um, you know, be in more rooms and just say, hey, this is what we've been through. This is, you know, we've seen some shit and it's OK. And here we yeah. are. Uh, yeah. you, can do it, you can do it too. It won't be easy, but you can. So we, you know, just having opportunities like this is, is amazing. So thank you so much for having us. And it, it does mean a lot because, you know, this is, you know, making some of our dreams come true, you know, early on. Yeah, no, I just think it's so amazing that uh, you guys have both done so much work on yourselves individually and that, uh, you guys have really built up such a beautiful relationship. It gives hope to a lot of parents who've made a lot of mistakes and, you know, and I'm glad that you didn't have to go down, you know, the drug and alcohol route. That's, that was really the whole point of breaking the cycle. You know, maybe each generation gets a little bit better. You know, we pass on the good things too. I'd like to just mention that, you know, like, um, have a soul has evolved, you know, from the first day that he took his own sneakers and put them in the back of his car and drove the streets of mm -hmm. LA and giving out a pair of shoes. It's evolved to the point, you know, like, as he said earlier, of giving out 50,000 pairs of shoes with the help of healthy, um, NBA sponsors and, and otherwise, but he's also started an internship program called have a soul for success mm -hmm. where he brings in either like five or six, either homeless youth or youth um, that have just gotten out of high school, don't know what they were gonna do. And they immerse them, he immerses them along with, um, with uh, partners to, in the, uh, to learn about a nonprofit. What does it take to be an entrepreneur? What mm. does it take to be financially liter literate? What does it take to build a resume and to build um, a LinkedIn profile and, and market yourself? And so he, he kind of takes the, he's very qualified to do it. It's really quite wonderful to watch him work with these kids. And then we have like a dynamo board of directors. We've got some great board of directors that come in and share their experience. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's amazing. One is a financial planner. Another one worked for the Lakers, now works for Magic Johnson Foundation. You know, um, it's just incredible resources and they want to be involved. So, yeah. you know, what I'll say, what I'll say about Ricky is his, his energy is, is magnetic, not, it's just like people love what he's doing. They can see that his heart is in the right place. Mm -hmm. it's, you know, he's got purity of intention. So they rally around him. Our gala, which, you know, if you're in LA, I know you're not, but it's uh, March 24th, uh, we're having a gala and the Lakers are one of our sponsors. The Pacers are one of our sponsors, apartments.com. We've got an incredible, a lot of support. And then we've got an, an amazing host from Extra, you know, that TV show. Uh -huh. He's yeah. hosting. So there's, there's a lot coming up and going on and, and we, we're just like excited, very excited to be super in the exciting. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really cool. And the have a soul for success program is, is now by far one of my favorites because I get to mentor kids. Like I was once mentored 
and you know we also get to pay them uh, for their time here, and it's it's more than just the um, you know inner workings. It's of a the paid nonprofit. internship. It's a paid, it's paid internship. internship. Paid, paid internship. That's yeah. amazing. Six week paid internship. Um, we get to you know really just inspire and, and and create that safe place that we know that is so important to have and and yeah. bring them in and and then like she said then financial literacy and a, a long list of different perks uh other than just um you know working doing inventory um but they also get to uh coordinate their own have a soul events so i give them the keys to the organization and say this is how we do it go do it who do you want to give to that's that's proven to be uh, really empowering for them to to give back to organizations that they believe in um, through the Half a Soul mission, um, and yeah, it's it's uh, we're going on three years of that, so it's good. It is good. It's really good. Um, you know, and this all started from Ricky being a mentor in a high school, local high school. Mm -hmm. All started from him being asked to speak at different high schools. Uh, and tell his story. So I think, you know, going back to the writing of the book, I think that the, um, you know, he is very much like me in love story, you know, and the power of the story. And so um, he wanted to tell his, and mm -hmm. I thought, you know, this is a story worth telling, you know, so oh, how can I help you, yeah. you know? No, that's beautiful. It's it's very cool and very unique. Um, I don't actually know of any other situations where, you know, an author tells her story and then her son gives his perspective. And I think it's so needed. It's so needed. Like we need to have hope that relationships and families can heal. And I think it's so cool that you guys have a project that you can work on together that has such heart and meaning and such impact, big yeah. impact. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty damn cool. It's, it's pretty damn cool. And the world <laughs> needs that hope right now, as we know, it's yeah. like, it's just like things can be so, you know, so many people suffering right now yeah. and wondering how can I heal the relationship? And I'll tell you, it's one day at a time. <laughs> one day at a time where have I heard that yes <laughs> I love that well listen I would like to um I'm going to have you send me links to all the things I'll put everything in the show notes and tell remind me again when the book is coming out I mean we have it scheduled for my birthday so that's going to be December 13th 12 13 on your birthday. that's a nice birthday present it is. Happy it birthday is. to you. Are you gonna, how old are you going to be? No, I just kidding. <laughs> the, the big 40. Nah. Yeah. 29? It's the oh, 10th yeah. anniversary of your 30th birthday? Yeah, something like that. I, I can lost count. <laughs> yeah. But it'll yeah, be but available on Amazon, everything. I don't know when this is going to air, but um, I can, you know, when we get closer, I can send you the live link. Yeah. Send me all the things. We'll put it everything in the show notes and we'll see if we can't uh, get it published right around the launch date. Very cool. Perfect. Yeah. Well, listen, it was such a pleasure to meet you, Ricky. Wendy, you know, I love you. Anytime you need me, I'm your girl. <laughs> and uh, thank you so much for all the service that you do. Well, it means a lot. Thank you so much for having us and um, you're the best. Thanks. <laughs>